result of the French Revolution, um, which was what? Does anyone want to tell me about this painting? What's that? Okay, Jeffy sold his soul. <laughs> it's Napoleon crowning himself. Yes, this is well. This is Napoleon crowning himself. This is just after that. What's Napoleon doing? He's crowning. He's crowning his wife. He's crowning his wife, Josephine. He kneels before him. He holds the crown. This is just after he's crowned himself emperor of France, which was yes, the exact opposite, really, of uh, what those ideals of the revolution were, which were you know equality for one thing. Um, you know, freedom of voting and things like this. Um, yeah, that didn't really happen. Um, in any case, it's a monumental painting that we did it for Napoleon uh, by commission, uh, which is a huge shift than what we had seen that we doing right before the revolution, during the revolution, now we're looking after the revolution. Um, we also look at this painting um, by Grove, who is W's student. Um, and what is Grove showing us? The sick and the dead, yes. Napoleon as a Jesus Christ, kind of. Yes, Napoleon almost in the position of Jesus. You know, touching the wounded. He's sticking his finger right up in those little pustules. And what is this an example of? Why is Gro doing this? Yes? Political propaganda. This is totally political propaganda. This is in the age before CNN. We do not have embedded reporters on our military campaigns. Um, so if we have grown, you know, Napoleon decides, I will bring a painter with me on these campaigns, and they will sort of frame everything um, as I would like. Even though, you know, Gros is still showing us kind of the devastation of the French troops. This is not an entirely whitewashed version of what happened. Um, but there's no indication that Napoleon was fearful of getting sick, um, or, any, or that he then poisoned all of his troops following this incident. Um, so we're turning now, we're looking more at uh, Crow sort of um, traveling with Napoleon, depicting Napoleon's um, battles. Um, this is another example where uh, a painting of a losing situation. Um, this is Napoleon in Russia. Um, here's Napoleon on the horse. Um, we see sort of this vast expanse of the Russian winter, which would ultimately de defeat Napoleon. Um, and we see sort of the huddled masses uh, of sort of French soldiers. Here Napoleon is uh, being depicted as magnanimous. You know, he's uh, ordering help for the wounded Russians. This is a devastating battle. Uh, something like 20,000 French lost their lives at 60,000. And on the Russian side, we had 27,000 lives lost at 80,000 troops. Um, so there's nothing really that Russia can do to make this good. But, you know, as a Um, the, uh, something good, usually, at least that. Uh, and here, instead, what we're looking at is Napoleon, uh, you know, showing generosity uh, in, a, in a battle that he, you know, that really had no winners, um, just losers. And again, he's just barely kind of taller than everybody else um, in the field of vision. Um, also, at this time, we have uh, Goya in Spain, family. Um, a very sort of strange painting has been debated by critics. Um, if this is uh, a satire, perhaps, of the royal family. Because they were depicted, um, well, how are they depicted? How do they look to you guys? Posing. What's that? Posing. Posing? Yes, they're definitely posing. Yes? Okay, they look a little not connected, a little discombobulated, yes? The eyes all look the same. The eyes all look the same? Oh. Fear. Fear? They don't look, yeah, this, I, I would agree with maybe the fear comment. You know, they don't, this is not like a portrait of, you know, uh, royal power, exactly. There's a little hesitancy. Um, we have people looking in different directions. This person looking like at a painting in the back. Um, and they look really kind of normal. If you actually look at their faces, look at it in your book if you can't see on the screen. 
they look kind of ugly and really like normal, ugly people. There's not a lot of flattery going on here. Remember, whenever you have a portrait, you're dealing with a level of flattery. Um, if you look at sort of the king's chin, if you look at the king's crown, you have this, these people don't look uh, you know, like they're necessarily fit to be the royal family. Um, there are all sorts of sort of problems going on here. The queen was allegedly having an affair um, with her second in command. Um, nobody really thought Charles was a great ruler. Um, we also have, and there's all this sort of confusion, you know, people are stepping out in front of other people, blocking other people. Some people aren't even paying attention. Um, we also have an element on the far left of what is painted. Oh, it's Goya himself, <laughs> hidden in the shadows there, you can see Goya. Right, very much, I think, thinking about his predecessor, Velazquez, who had also been uh, the king, can't you remember, who was the first one to sort of depict himself in the presence of royalty. Um, so here, it's now, you know, 150 years later, when Goya is able uh, to show himself with the king, even not very effectual ruler. Um, and, and the queen is not some sort of beautiful, wonderful woman. Um, and, and so it's unclear, again, if Goya's intent, or this is what these people just really look like, or what was going on. Um, uh, it was Yeah. 
of Napoleon by the French painter Ang, who was he was trained in the academy. Another one of W's students. Um, they're influenced also by Poussin, of this idea of line and classicism and all of these things. Um, and here Ang depicts Napoleon on this imperial throne um, as you know, really almost you know a despot. Uh, you can't really help but think of Napoleon, of course. As a king, um, even though you know this is that's not what Napoleon. Napoleon is more generally because he had risen up to the ranks, supposedly. Um, and here, this is sort of how Anne depicts him as this, um, you know, head-on Napoleon scepter. Um, he has this imperial eagle here, and all the robes and the trappings of royalty, um, which is very similar again to how Anne does these sort of classical. Um, but he does a lot of uh, classical mythology uh, paintings. This one is Oedipus in space. Uh, remember, Oedipus is the guy who uh, killed his father and married his mother, and then unbeknownst, unbeknownst to him. So Oedipus did not have an Oedipus complex, um, <laughs> which was later, you know, a Freud term thinking of wanting to be with your mother and your father. In any case, so here we have Oedipus sort of solving the riddle of the Sphinx. Um, what's that? The Sphinx is tiny. Yeah, the Sphinx is tiny. Uh, we see sort of uh, the people before who have not made it. Um, in any case, if think about the, the line, Pierce Spiro, all of these sort of classical um, things that uh, Anne is really bringing back. Uh, just keep that in mind as opposed to now what we're thinking about with the romanticism. Um, Goya was more in the, what we call an unromantic idea, and also Jericho, who we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today. Um, so Jericho does these two paintings uh, for two different salons, um, 1812 and 1814. Um, and he does, Jericho actually is not a classically trained painter. Um, he doesn't become a painter until he's 21, and then he only lives to be about 30 something. Um, so he has this very, very short career. Um, he kind of comes onto the scene with this picture on the left, the charging cavalryman, which is interesting because one thing is anonymous. It's not a particular cavalryman, it's sort of anybody um, on the battlefield. So this is sort of the moment that we're in. We have Napoleon trying to take over all of Europe. Um, and so this uh, image would have been very kind of identifiable. Uh, as, as something that everybody could be involved in. Um, we have this strange relationship of uh, that body twisting in space, kind of coming on this 180 as the horse is charging off a very dynamic diagonal. Um, we see hints of a battle in the background. Um, so this painting worked. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't criticized too much, even though it's not perhaps the best example of uh, academic painting. Um, in 1814, Jericho decided to do kind of appendage to the charging cavalryman, which is the wounded cavalryman. <coughs> um, and here we have the man sort of on the ground. He's not on his horse. He's not triumphant. And you're really changing the relationship of what we normally looked at as uh, history painting. It's not a portrait. It's not anything, really. Um, and it's certainly not triumphant. It's not just to celebrate the victors. Um, here we have somebody who uh, is we know to be wounded, is looking fearful, um, scared, foreboding. Um, he's much too 
too big also in relationship to his horse, so the horse is too small, it's unclear. Um, we have this strange arm situation. Um, not, it, this painting was not well received because it couldn't fit in any category. It wasn't doing those things we normally think of. Uh, you know, it's not supposed to inspire, it's not telling us something grand and triumphant or anything like that. Um, and partly, yes? Where is this woman? You know, I don't know. But the fact that he's off his horse and things aren't going well, it was interpreted as that he's wounded. Um, here, I mean, you have to assume that if you could ride a horse, you'd be riding a horse. Um, so here, again, in 1814, this is sort of the fall of Napoleon. So this is very much um, Jerry Coe speaking to the time of what's going on. There's, um, this is not necessarily, you know, this is a lot of people coming back from France as wounded soldiers and not as victors, and or not coming back at all because they're dead. So Jerry Coe, it's sort of a history painting, but it's completely anonymous. Um, so it doesn't fit into any of these categories. Um, so what happens? Uh, Napoleon is kicked out. He's exiled. Um, and Louis XVIII is crowned, um, who is the brother of beheaded Louis XVI. Um, so this is sort of, again, we're following these results of the revolution kind of unfolding. Um, and Jericho is kind of along for the ride with us. Um, and he's interested in sort of, he has these academic aspirations, even though he's not academically um, and he wants to do a huge, big history painting. He's thinking about a subject, this is a self-portrait, well, it's presumed to be a self-portrait of him. Um, he's kind of this melancholy man in deep shadows. You can sort of see that this is more casual. Um, he's not interested in the background. The, you know, the painter's palette behind him is rather sort of sketchily done. Um, we see the skull, which could either be a comment on mortality, it could also be just a tool that artists use when they're thinking about rendering the human body and things like that. Um, this is, again, we've seen a lot of artists' portraits uh, in this class. So this is, again, a, a sort of different take on that. The artist is sort of uh, melancholy, a dreamer, a thinker. He doesn't quite know how to find himself. Um, he does show himself to be a painter because he has sort of the accoutrements of the artist's studio in the background. So when Jericho decides to do, oops, forgot about this one. Uh, when Jericho decides to do, in the graph of Medusa, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, but before that, he does this lithograph showing um, the return of the French troops from Russia. And again, how is he showing these French troops? Make good change? Yeah. Meet down? Yeah. Yeah. We don't get any sense of the 
revolution in David. David is just trying to get us to focus on the ideals, um, the, the, the over, you know, this kind of thing in the air, not the actual reality, but um, the reason, you know, the good of the whole, the, the sacrifice for the many, um, that your life is inconsequential, that you, you know, even as these women mourn, they are much more creative than the only ones that they're thinking about such things, personal relationships. Um, it's very clearly designed to tell us that these men are doing the right thing, um, and that if death comes to them, you know, so what, they will die uh, for a good cause. Um, Jericho tells us something completely opposite, right? There's, you know, we think about the people left on the battlefield here, that they have not died for any particular cause, um, that they return to draggled and wounded and um, not the same, and that these are the realities of battle. Uh, so we have different conceptions, competing conceptions that you think. Yes? Is this the first time in history we've seen anti war sentiments in art? Um, is it the first? It's, it's very close to being first. Goya also had anti war but yeah, usually art was celebrated, especially official painting was been celebrated. Like, now this is not an official painting, but what Jericho goes on to do is official painting, and so that's what we're going to talk about. So this is what Jericho decides to do as his big salon history painting. And it is a very strange painting, because it also does not celebrate a victory, and it also doesn't tell us about some glorious event that we should remember and have uh, patriotic thoughts about. Um, what this is Jerry Chris painting graphic of Medusa. And this comes to us with a very sort of long, involved story, which I'm going to tell you about. Um, but it's a very different kind of history painting. It's very enormous. It's 16 by 23 feet, which I just have no conception of, but I'm pretty sure this is not 23 feet. Um, pretty sure that this painting is bigger than the screen. Um, and this is Jerry Chris' big announcement about that he has arrived on the scene as a history painting, but that history painting itself has completely changed. So the story of this painting um, is that the French are now uh, under the terms of um, the, I think you want to say eviction of Napoleon. Then exile. Exile, thank you. They have exiled Napoleon. Under those terms, France's allies have allowed France to reclaim Colony, one of which is Senegal, which is right here. Yeah. 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 It's the peach one right underneath uh, Mauritania and right next to Mali. Oh, it is the peach one. Yeah, it's that one. Okay. This is Senegal. Okay. So what happens is that the French send out a ship to recolonize. Um, and the ship is called the Medusa, and it ends up there's France, there's Spain, there's France. The idea is we're going to sail from here to here. Um, so we're going to reclaim um, this, this colony. I mean, again, this whole idea of colonization is very fraught one. But the French sort of send out sort of you know people. They send out a botanist, and they send out people interested in farming, and they send out sailors, and they send out all sorts of people who are now going to be uh, living in the French colony of Senegal. Um, and the ship ends up, the Medusa ends up running aground um, in, in clear waters, no storm, nothing. Runs aground, it's been steering an erratic course, and part of this is because uh, the captain of the Medusa was, had been appointed through nepotism, not because of any particular skill, because this captain really had no skill, because running a ship around in clear weather is just ridiculous. Um, but it didn't have any of its other ships in its convoy nearby because it happened to have been such an erratic course. And after two days of the Medusa kind of being stuck, it becomes clear that everyone is going to have to abandon the ship. Now there's 400 people on the ship, but it only has six lifeboats, which only fit 250 people. So who do you think gets on the lifeboat? Yes, the higher upper class. Um, and then the alternate idea of these other 150 people is to build a raft out of the remains of this ship, out of the Medusa, which is why I get the name, the raft of the Medusa. This is the raft, this is the diagram of the raft that they built. Um, it's 68 feet by 23 feet. It's supposed to 
typical 150 people, 150 people who did not get in the lifeboat. And the idea is that these lifeboats are going to pull uh, this raft with them. Um, okay, it sounds vaguely plausible, um, but what happens is that 150 people get on this raft and immediately become uh, submerged up to their waist in water. Um, this is not a good situation, and it just so happens that it's really slowing the lifeboats down. Um, so the lifeboat people don't really like this situation, and they essentially cut the ties to the raft um, and say, see you later to the raft. And so the raft is now sort of set adrift um, in the ocean, you know, until, you know, hopefully someone will find them. Um, so this is sort of the situation that Jericho is painting. Now this actually happened in 1816. This is the story that Jericho um, knows and that everybody knew because this is a huge scandal. Um, how do we know what went on on this ship, uh, the shipwreck story? It's because one of the survivors wrote an expose. Of course the French government wanted to cover it all up, but one of the survivors writes this expose, um, which, you know, became, uh, Um, and we didn't have, you know, news reporters out there being like, I can't believe it. There wasn't like helicopter choppers in the water being like, this raft situation. So nobody really knows what's going on. Um, now, on the second day of uh, the raft's journey, um, you know, they're basically floating in the water. Some people are getting washed away uh, because there's not necessarily always something to hang on to. You're really, the water is all around you. Uh, they have a mutiny because they're really upset. Um, so in the mutiny, uh, 60 people are killed. The mutiny is uh, eventually sort of squashed. And Jericho is thinking about this story. This story sort of unfolds through time. And he's thinking like, how am I going to paint this story of this shipwreck um, when it has all these different moments? So he has to think about it and distill that to one singular moment. And part of what he's sort of thinking through this is to paint, or sorry, this is a sketch, um, to sort of represent all these different moments in his studio. This painting takes Jericho uh, eight months to do. He really kind of walks himself away in the studio and goes through all of the moments in this story. So this is on the second, the second day of being shipwrecked. We have this mutiny. Uh, we can see sort of uh, this murderous people kind of going off into the waves. They have weapons. Uh, we have kegs of wine. Of course, they're French, and they did take all the wine with them. Um, we have dead bodies, we have this complete um, chaos going on here. It's driving bodies, mad at each other, absolute violence. Um, it's unclear sort of what even is going on. Um, very much sort of like the riding of kind of massive bodies in Michelangelo's Last Judgment. Um, Jericho has to think about how to depict these bodies um, so that we there's some kind of coherent story taking. Um, but he too sort of uses, maybe it's easier to see, you know, all of these really kind of monkey, every muscle is tense, everything is very muscular. Um, we have just thriving bodies, thriving humanity. Um, the most violent sort of times are here on the right. Again, very similar to uh, Michelangelo's Last Judgment, where we have um, sort of gates of hell over on the lower right. And here sort of the souls rise up to heaven. But really, they're just all of the
decides that this is the moment that he wants to depict. <laughs> Sorry. Well, part of the reason, what well, he's thinking about uh, Peter Paul Rubens, he's thinking about how Rubens used that sort of the stacking up of bodies, the thrust of bodies, all to do one thing. They're all riding together to come with one goal here. And that's what he finally, this is the final painting, um, this is what he finally sets on, where we have this very dynamic diagonal kind of shooting up through the painting. Also, it's, it's almost an X uh, kind of composition here, um, where we have a diagonal crossing up here and crossing up here. We have two sort of peaks uh, to this painting. We have this rising humanity coming up here um, in, you know, culminating uh, in this black man who is this, this apex of this kind of pyramid. But that pyramid is very traditional. You know, we've seen it since the Renaissance, that pyramidal composition. Um, so he hasn't really changed the term necessarily the composition, but he's trying to figure out how to depict this, this monumental unfolding story. You think it's more effective than the final version? Okay. Did someone say more people? Mm -hmm. It seems like he kind of concentrates the people who go that pyramid, you know, each side of the pyramid to go up. And then there are hands going out to draw your eyes. You know, even the man standing to the next near the mask, their arms are pointing towards that peak as well. Absolutely. All of these people, anyone who's conscious enough, um, is focused on this pyramid, on rising up, literally kind of rising up, and that tilting in the graph also contributes to it. Yes? Is that the thing that bothers you more than the side? Yes. And the other one, he looks more, I guess, shot. Here, yeah, because he has a head. Yeah, and that looks like a head. Yeah. No, they were definitely out, but it was 12 days. Very, 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 very
emotional life, that we have these dead bodies, that we have this man sort of reaching out, which he still maintains here. We have another dead person here. This is certainly a dead person. This is a dead person. Uh, so even among the living, there is this problem of death and decay, and that at any moment they can kind of slip onto the other side. So he's arranging this painting very much sort of from, from death to hope, from despair to hope. But I don't know that that means there's a happy end. Um, history from the side of the victims and not on the side of the victors because there is no victory. This is a tragedy for everyone. It's an embarrassment to the French government um, and it's, 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 a dis, it's dismay. It's, it's really a terrible thing to have happen when you live in sort of this modern society to know that all the aspirations of you know, colonization can end up uh, in this uh, complete and utter uh, kind of uh, undermining of all of those ideals. Yes. <laughs> I really don't know. This is really just the practice of doing it. So you can't celebrate anything, but telling 
met metaphorical battle or intellectual battle between um, the Pusanis and the Rubenis. Does anyone remember that? What did the Pusanis stand for? What? Balance, line, classical subject matter. And the Rubenis, what were they interested in? Composition? Color. Color. Convincing, big, color. Um, so we also have at this moment a competition between A, uh, who is also very much interested in line and neoclassicism and the things, remember that interested David, um, and Delacroix, who back to this idea of color. And you can, you, you can imagine that these two paintings are done at the same moment, and yet they are so very different. Uh, how can we compare these two? Yeah? It looks like it's commissioned by just by royalty, and the other one is just, the, the second thing is just complexes. There's not a particular person that's in it. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, this? It's not a portraiture like the other No, this is a history painting. And this is also kind of, this is also a history painting. Absolutely. But a completely imagined one. Right? We have this vow of Louis XIII, the the moment he came before Louis XIV. Um, so we're going back to this lineage of French royalty, um, which is a strange subject. And we have, what's Louis XIII doing? Following. Offering his crown. He's offering his crown to Mary and Jesus, yes. Which evokes what? Religious content? Yeah, this is the divine right of kings, right? Because of uh, you know God that these kings supposedly could rule, um, so very very kind of conservative idea here. Uh, and it's 1824. You know this is they were back actually to a monarchy in France at this time. Um, and so here we have Anne, you know, doing paintings just like before, where we glorify our you know royalty. Um, Delacroix, meanwhile, is at work doing. Um, very much more interesting in color, uh, and interesting in composition and line, and in these really kind of classical, fanciful um, subject matter that we've seen you know, throughout this class, but it's really kind of almost outdated, you could say, by 1824. Um, okay, which one is Rubenistic? Right, the Lacroix. The Lacroix.
Insurrection? Is that what you're looking for? That one is. No. Insubordination. Insubordination. What are you trying to look like? What's the word you're looking for? The word I'm looking for is that the French military is ordered by the king to kill the French citizens and they won't fire. So the French military defies the order of the king. Insubordination. Insubordination. Thank you. So we have this, you know, the problem of the military, you know, always on the side of the people. They're composed of the people, obviously. Um, the people can't, you know, they think this is ridiculous that Charles X is doing. They just have a revolution, you know, in 1789, it's really just ended in 1789, it went on and on and on. Um, so this is not what they wanted. So France has been sort of very unstable, shifting uh, politics going on, as you may have seen, as you've looked at all of these things. Um, and so this is what Delacroix, this is Delacroix's history painting of, and you'll notice the date, 1830. This is the July Revolution of 1830. Um, so now we have history literally catching up to history painting. Um, now what is Delacroix showing us in this uh, revolution of 1830? It's called Liberty Leading the People. So we have um, here this figure who um, is supposed to be Liberty, um, sort of charging through um, she's, she's had, we have all these sort of types of French society. We have a small little boy. Uh, we have, um, some people think this is a self portrait of Delacroix, but he's sort of this dandy in this top hat. We have a worker over here. Yes? No, I was going to say that I'm showing, depicting the, the people who rebelled against, um, much like they did in America, who rebelled against the, um, ruling class of people that just oppress them. So, yes. and, you know, they don't care about, that's that is basically the liberty that's standing in the middle of the country. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah? What is the first year of the statue? Oh, okay, yeah, I think that's right. That's my question. And really remember, I don't think happened there because it was built by If you're going to 
on the background, and it just becomes a very sort of sensual picture. Um, uh, again, remember the Delta is very interested in color. Um, and it's a sensual picture of death and sex. Um, so this also was deemed very controversial, even as it sort of maintained tenuously um, a connection to history painting. Um, think again the opposition between uh, Aang and Delacroix. But uh, again, almost the same moment that Delacroix is looking at Sarnopolis, uh, thinking about Sarnopolis, thinking about um, his very sort of exotic fantasy almost. Um, here we have Aang doing the obvious of his homework, um, where we have Mr. Homer being crowned. You know, he's looking right at Raphael's school of Athens. Very traditional, very linear, very easy to read. Everything is kind of laid out. You can even see this, uh, there's a portrait of Usam here. Uh, Shakespeare is kind of cut off. But you can see uh, Aang really just putting in the ordering everything uh, very clearly. Here we have just that mess of bodies. Everything is swirling around. Um, there's no uplifting moral message that we're supposed to be getting at all. Um, as opposed to uh, where Aang is, is showing us, oh, we have an allegorical figure here, it's either sort of fame or um, wisdom or something, and we have great figures of you know, Greek uh, from the classical past uh, mixed in with uh, more contemporary figures. So this is very a, a big split in the types of paintings that we're experiencing. Uh, in part, uh, you know, after we have the French Revolution, there's so many different kind of political angles going. Um, and totally, I mean, even Aang also goes in this sort of orientalist direction, um, even as he's painting sort of more conservative subjects. Um, he does his own his slave, Delacroix is a woman of Algiers. Um, there's a big interest in um, these, the, the colonies of France, basically, Algeria. Um, in this case, even though, you know, Delacroix hasn't even been to, he eventually does go to Africa, but this is a fantasy. These painters hadn't actually been there at the time when he came, he has not been to Africa. Yeah. Is that kind of basically like Morocco? Yeah, yeah, but he has it, he goes, he does eventually go, but these paintings are painted again for this uh, French art market that finds um, a kind of fantasy in this as a departure. We're moving away from history painting as sort of what uh, people are finding uh, as interesting painting. So we will pick up with this um, next.